Welcome to WOW, the Woman of the Week podcast series by Pharma Voice. This episode was made possible by a generous sponsorship from Dudnick. For more information on Dudnick, please visit dudnick.com. In this episode, Taryn Grom, Editor-in-Chief of Pharma Voice Magazine, meets with Chantel Dodson, Senior VP Health Systems at Astellas. Chantel, welcome to the Pharma Voice Wow podcast program. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. It's our pleasure to have you. I was really intrigued as I looked through your bio. Your role as a Senior VP Health Systems is so comprehensive. I don't know how you wear all the hats. So can you please explain all the areas of the organization that you touch and how they all intersect? The health systems organization at Astellas is made up of six different functions, five primary functions. We have strategic analysis on our contracts and pricing, payer and channel account management. We have a reimbursement patient access organization. We have a health systems marketing group that provides support for marketing materials specific to the health systems organization. We have a key account management group and then also a group that provides operational support. So you're right in that it's a very diverse organization primarily targeted to payers and large institutional decision makers around patient access to medications. And how do they all kind of intertwine? They work together first with the therapeutic areas across Astellas, so our oncology portfolio as well as our hospital portfolio and and urology. And they work collectively to make sure, number one, that we secure access for patients. So when a healthcare professional makes a decision to write an Astellas product, that we have access for patients to be able to receive that, whether that be through their payer organization or through our support programs that we provide. It's also important that even within health systems that we really understand the overall product portfolio strategies so that collectively they are working together and moving in the same direction. So, for example, our account reimbursement group needs to understand Um, what the needs are in the prostate cancer population and how to help patients gain access there. And working very closely with our marketing group as well as our broader payer and channel account management group to do that. Excellent. And that brings me to my next question because that's a lot of data. (laughs) And since you joined Estellas, you've really expanded the health economics and outcomes research function. And I understand you've pioneered multiple innovative real-world data projects including the creation of two national registries and innovative research partnerships with a number of managed care and academic organizations. So talk to me about how you approach creating these new initiatives and what are some of the goals for each of them and why was this an important area for you to address? Sure. Well, I have a very unique career path within the Stellis and that, and actually my, my whole career has largely been focused in medical affairs. Only recently, about nine months ago, did I move over to the commercial side of the business. And part of that focus in medical affairs has been my, my desire and my care for patients and patient access to medications, but also bringing value to patients. So in joining us, as my focus in health outcomes health economics and outcomes research was really in demonstrating value of Estella's products. And at that point, we had a very small health outcomes group that we grew and expanded and subsequently created broader global alignment around that group. I then moved on to head the Medical Affairs Americas organization where we took a unique approach, and instead of doing a pure company-initiated randomized controlled clinical trial, we created a large registry, for example, in prostate cancer because we wanted more real-world evidence that wasn't available in existing real-world evidence databases or electronic medical records because there was so much missing information. We wanted to create a registry where we were able to get additional information from patients about how their disease impacted them where, how they were treated throughout their disease, and also equally as important as we collected caregiver data within that registry, which is not something that you can do in a randomized controlled clinical trial. And that registry is is still ongoing, and we're really looking forward to, although I'm not in medical affairs anymore, to being able to analyze that data 
and provide some important information for healthcare professionals to make decisions in the future. Wonderful. And you say you're not in medical affairs, but once you're in medical affairs, aren't you always? Well, in in many ways, yes. I I have a (laughs) strong allegiance to medical affairs, and and I do have a different approach now. So I do do love medical affairs, but I equally love the group that I'm in now, and I think the commonality for all of that is the patient. Exactly. That's perfect. So talk to me about what some of the goals are for each of these initiatives. I mean, I think what you're talking about is so topical right now, and everybody's trying to get as much information about patients as possible to make better decisions for even future drugs. So talk to me about what you're doing. It's true, and sometimes in those situations, you have to actually create the data yourself just because especially in the U.S. healthcare system, data collection in the real world is still fairly disparate. We're making a lot of advances and the people are starting to realize that the more consistently they collect data, the better they can make decisions. But what we did was to take an approach to doing that ourselves and creating a database by collecting information on prostate cancer patients, for example, and which just doesn't exist anywhere else. ASCO has been very Um, been a big leader in that area as well. AUA has moved in that direction the last several years too. And that's just something that's really important to us because we, although we believe that we, we run very strong clinical trials, randomized controlled clinical trials that give great data on the efficacy and safety of our product, often there's other data that, that's almost equally as important that happens in the real world and we need that data so patients can make better decisions. Sure. Um, speaking of ASCO, which was just this past week, or for our listeners in, you know, right here in early June, um, recently launched, Estella recently launched the Estella's Oncology C3 Prize, Changing Cancer Care. Talk to me about this initiative. How did it come about, and what are you looking for in terms of entries? And then finally, what determines a finalist? I'd be happy to. Changing Cancer Care is in our fourth year for ourselves, and it's something that we're very passionate about. This program was initiated by my colleague, Mark Reisenhower, who's Senior Vice President of Oncology here at Estellas, and he was inspired to create this program after himself directly experiencing challenges as a caregiver to his father who had head and neck cancer. And the challenge made him really think about how do we support and inspire innovative non-treatment ideas that could help patients and their caregivers. So it's, it's it's going beyond the medicine and going beyond the treatment. And we're looking for ideas. They can be big, they can be small, but they, we want high potential ideas that help improve the lives of people who are, who are impacted by cancer, again, outside of their medications. This year we're looking for ideas in three categories, the cancer care journey, cancer health disparities, and cancer survivorship. We launched this program and have evolved it over the the past four years, and we will award up to $200,000 in total grants and resources to the the recipients of the award. And again, big or small ideas, it doesn't matter to us. We just want to spark better journeys for cancer care. That's excellent. And how can folks um, put forward their ideas? So entries are open now, and they will be accepted through July 15th, and they will be uh, reviewed by a, a group that has been working with us. They are not required to have it be a company, be an academic organization, even have a finished product. We're just looking for ideas that will help us in those three areas that I mentioned. So, for example, if they have an idea around the cancer care journey, if they have an idea that helps improve the patient experience or ease decision-making or helps them navigate the system as they're being treated for their cancer, if they they come up with an idea that addresses health disparities, an idea that may reduce the burden of cancer care in underserved populations, or thirdly, to address cancer uh, survivorship challenges, they can submit these through our c3prize.com website, which is available now. On the website, it has all the details about how the idea may fit into one of those categories. So we would direct everyone to take a look at that website. Fantastic. I'm excited about your initiative. I think everybody has a cancer story to tell. It's such a prevalent thing in our society, unfortunately. 
So I'll be very interested to hear what the results are. Sounds great. We take a lot of pride in moving these non-treatment ideas forward. It's not about our products. We don't maintain ownership of any of these ideas. We simply want to improve cancer care beyond medicine. Fantastic. Now I want to switch tacks just a little bit. You talked about your career in medical affairs, and you really started at the Department of Veterans Affairs. Talk to me about this experience and how it shaped, you know, your future career. I joined the Department of Medical Affairs actually right out of my PharmD program. I did a year of residency in the Department of, of Veterans Affairs. It's a unique in healthcare environment because allied healthcare professionals, non-physicians, can provide direct patient care in the Veterans Administration. And I had the opportunity to do that and see firsthand to take care of patients who were on anticoagulation therapy, take care of their pharmacokinetics if they were on um, low therapeutic index drugs, to help patients who had had a heart attack post-MI to make sure that they were on all of their appropriate treatments and they were treated to gold. And I saw firsthand the benefit of helping patients navigate that journey and helping arm them with more information, helping them to be more compliant with their medication and achieve better outcomes. And it really shaped me for life. It, It helped me feel firsthand when you make a difference for a patient what a difference it really makes and made me want to do that even more. And such an important pot patient population, right, our veterans Absolutely. who have given so much for our country. So that's a wonderful story. Thank you so much for sharing that experience. You're also on the board of directors of the National Pharmaceutical Council. Tell us about this organization and its goals. Sure. So the National Pharmaceutical Council is, is actually made up of industry representation from from pretty much every large, mid-sized, and many small pharmaceutical companies. And the remit is to, again, much of what I was talking about earlier, is to help convey the value of medicine and help people understand some of the miscommunications around the value of medicine. I've been on that board now for, I guess, five years. So I started out on the research committee and then moved on to the board, been very actively involved with them. They take an active leading role in in healthcare today, and one thing that they're doing that I would like to share is a project called Going Below the Surface, and it's really to help people see, look at the healthcare system holistically and look for solutions to solve for the, for the challenges and the obstacles that are out there in ensuring that patients have access to treatments and that we help to control healthcare expenditures over time and that those healthcare expenditures are not always about medications. In fact, medications have in many, many examples been able to lower health care expenditures, but unfortunately are often the target of discussions and debate. So this is an important project that they are working closely with health affairs on, and there are multiple different stakeholders across multiple facets of the healthcare industry that are collaborating on this, and I'm, I'm personally looking forward to seeing the outcome of, of their great work. Chantal, that's really important work, and um Kudos to you for really being part of such an important initiative. Um, You are also, because you're not busy enough, uh, a board member of the Society for Women's Health Research, which is SWHR, an organization, quite frankly, I'm not familiar with. So please tell me about um, this association, too. This is another great organization and one that everybody should know about because they were a leading organization many years ago in changing the FDA's approach in including women in clinical trials. They are a leading organization in promoting sex differences. So sometimes people often aren't aware that we've seen this happen in many places in healthcare that women respond differently to medications or various treatments. And this organization's remit is to really highlight those differences and advocate for those differences, whether it be in migraine treatment, diabetes, uh, vasomotor symptoms, things that directly affect women. Not one size doesn't fit all. And so, so they've been a key advocate along the way for changing that paradigm, and they've done a lot of great work to do just that. Excellent. We'll get the word out about them as well. That's terrific. With your finger in so many different pies and having access to so many different thought leaders across the industry, 
talk to me about what excites you in terms of where you see the industry going. I'm excited about continuing to develop medications that serve the needs of patients. There's still so many diseases out there that don't have adequate or oftentimes any treatments, and that's something that Estella continues to be focused on. As you mentioned earlier, a lot of people have been impacted by cancer. My family has as well. I had a niece who was diagnosed with cancer going into her senior year of high school, oh. a very rare sarcoma, and she benefited from great treatments and, and is, is doing well. As a matter of fact, she became a healthcare professional herself. She's a nurse now at a, at a leading academic institution and, and doing great, and she's a cancer survivor thanks to the treatment that she received. That's wonderful news, and I'm glad that she's, in, she's paying it forward. That's wonderful. Yes. You know, you talk about different companies and their approaches. Do you see that there's a more collaborative atmosphere now amongst the different major pharmaceutical companies when we're talking about some data and to making some real progress in some of these tougher diseases that we haven't been able to crack yet? I do think you see more collaboration today than you saw 10 years ago, but I think that collaboration's been happening for, for some time now. It's probably becoming more and more visible, but... I do think that that's, that's growing and it's going to, going to continue to grow because in, in the big scheme of things, we're all about the patient. And when we can bring products to the market, even collaboratively, that help the patient, then I know that's the goal that we all have. Wonderful. You have won a lot of different awards and accolades, including being named an HBA Rising Star. And more recently, or as recently, about you've won the Estella's Vision Award. Talk to me about that award. So the Estella's Vision Award that we received was part of a team effort, and it was as we had globalized our medical affairs organization to begin to create better alignment and better sharing of information and better um, defined processes around things like investigator-sponsored research, around how we conduct health outcomes research across the globe and share that information, how we ensure that we design protocols that are scientifically rigorous, clinically relevant protocols across the global organization. And that team, the focus of that team, of which I was a, a part of, was to really help us shift and move towards that greater global alignment. So it was an honor to win that award. That's wonderful and such important work, too, because I can imagine that processes have been streamlined and you're seeing market improvement then within the organization. Absolutely, and it's an area we continue to evolve in. Sure. Um, with so much career insights and, and, and so many things you've done in your career, can you share what we call a wow moment? Is there something in your career that stands out to you? I would not maybe highlight a single wow moment, moment, but if I think back in my career, the thing that stands out to me is I've been so fortunate to have strong leaders around me who were willing to guide me and shape me, serve as role models that really invested in my leadership development. And I look back, I think it's hard sometimes to see, especially earlier in your, in your career, what people are doing for you. But when I look back, I say, wow, because those people, they really invested in me. And because of that, I try to ensure that I always make time to invest in other people because I'm so fortunate for what they invested in me. So maybe it's not a single wow moment, but it's many wow moments that I, that I really appreciate. Fantastic. Now, you talked about leadership and leadership style. How would you define your leadership style? I would define my leadership style in two ways, two things that I would say is I aspire to be a continual learner and promote that. So I'm very committed to, for example, reading leadership books. There is a global leadership conference that I attend every year. I don't miss it. I haven't missed it in 15 years because I learn a lot from it. And so it's important for me to be a continual learner. And the other thing that's important to me and that I would describe is I really work hard to be an authentic leader. I bring my authentic self to work. I think that's important. People see that. And I really try to make sure that I do that. Those are two really important leadership traits. And with all the leaders I speak to, often those two always are ranked either one and two or two and one. So 
good for you. Finally, what's one piece of advice you would give to your younger self if you could dial back the clock a little bit, something you wish you knew back then? If I could dial back the clock, I would really reflect on some things I'd just share with you and, and to tell myself to be purposeful about leadership development. I was very fortunate early in my career when I was in the VA. I had a strong leader mentor that started to shape my career. I then went into big pharma and was fortunate to work for a company that really invested in leadership development programs for their leaders, and I benefited from that. Not everybody has the resources to to do that, but because I got that earlier in my career, then I committed to that myself. As I mentioned, every year I go to the Global Leadership Summit. I never miss it. And had I not learned the importance of leadership development early on, I probably wouldn't have known that and been that committed. So looking back, I would tell myself early on, get committed regardless if you have those opportunities early or not, because it will be important throughout your career. Thank you so much. I really loved speaking with you, and I learned so much. Thanks so much for being part of our WOW podcast program. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Thank you for listening to this episode of WOW, the Women of the Week podcast series. And thanks again to Dudnick for sponsoring this program. For more information on Dudnick, please visit dudnick.com. We also encourage you to listen to additional episodes at pharmavoice.com slash wow. This 2019 program is copyrighted by PharmaLinks, LLC.